Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this presentation of the MAP Society of Wisconsin. My name is Yovanka Ristic, and I am the reference librarian here at the AGS, so I'm glad to see so many of you made it. I was kind of worried with the weather, but thank you so much for coming today. Um, before we get started, I just want to let you know of some upcoming events here. So this Friday, March 1st at 3 o'clock, we are having one of our series of academic adventurers talks. And our speaker is going to be Alan Nagain Rashak, who was the campus photographer here for about four years, I think, retired now. And he's going to be uh, giving a presentation about you know, 40 years of photography here. So that should be very interesting with historic uh, photographs of our campus. So that's this Friday at 3. Uh, the next meeting of the MAP Society of Wisconsin is going to be on a Sunday, Sunday, March 31st at 2 p.m. Our speaker is going to be Eugenia Afino Guanova from Marquette University. She's a professor of Spanish and Spanish literature. And she's going to be talking about a project that she's been working on about uh, Spanish travelers in the 19th century. So that should be very interesting. Again, Sunday, March 31st at 2 p.m. And then very shortly thereafter, on Wednesday, April 3rd, we are having uh, another presentation by Marcy Bidney, our curator here at the AGSL. Uh, yes, that was supposed to be held in January. That's why it's so close together. It was rescheduled for uh, Wednesday, April 3rd because of that extreme cold weather we had at the original date. So there's a flyer about that up at the table in the back if you're interested. Um, she's going to be talking about Imagining the Moon, a History of Lunar Visualizations. And that is going to be in the evening. So at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, April 3rd, again right here. There is an exhibit about moon-related things in place right now, so you can also see that while you're here today. So uh, if you are not a member of the MAP Society of Wisconsin and would like to be, there's a green sign-up sheet also at the high table in the back, so you can pick up one of those or talk to me. Okay, and then also later in April, April 25th, which is a Thursday, we will be having our annual Maps and America Holzheimer Lecture. So um, just save the date at this point. I, I don't have the exact title with me, but it's coming up also in April. So a lot of events coming up in the future. So now to today's event, um, which, by the way, is very generously being sponsored by Boucher Automotive. So we do want to thank them for their donation to the AGS Library. Pass it on. And, uh, yeah. So our speaker today is Charles, or better known as Chuck Olson. Uh, he has his BA in International Relations and an MBA in International Business, both from UW-Madison. He has retired as an Army Lieutenant Colonel after 21 years of service. He has visited 30 countries and he has had a lifelong passion for cartography and geography. He's also something of a globe collector and a member of the MAP Society. So today he's going to be talking to us about 17 fascinating world map oddities. And I just want to point out that we also have a display of some of the things that he's going to be talking about over in the next aisle to take a look at later. So please help me in welcoming Chuck Olson. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys for making us welcome on the whole display over there. And um, before I start anything else, thank you for coming out. You know, on a day where you're like, how do I get out of my own driveway? It's been happening a lot. You know, to come out and look at like the world and, and uh, different views on it is really appreciated. Uh, it's maybe nice to get out of the grid for an hour. And this is the topic. And uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I was stationed three years in Germany, and there's an expression called not und. I don't know if I, but it really means and so. So it, it's kind of twofold. So and so, like you know, who is this guy standing by the globe? Um, but before I say anything, I just need to recognize where I have this love of, of globes and the world and learning. Uh, that's my dad uh, getting pinned down by General Westmoreland at Airborne School. Dad, raise your hand really quick. Yeah. So thank you. He also outranks me, Colonel Olson. And uh, there's my mom, uh, Lieutenant Olson, and during the uh, the Korean War era. So mom, raise your hand. And, uh, so that's, I, 
you know, obviously why I'm here, but you know, my love of travel. Uh, they actually took us out as a family for two months to travel Europe out of school. The homework didn't, wasn't fun when we got out, but, uh, <laughs> but that's a love. I was only nine. Uh, my family's here, uh, Margie, Dane, and Charlotte. You guys just want to wave? Thanks for coming. You kids got out of school for this, huh? <laughs> okay. And that's just one of the 30 countries I've been in. That was a Japan uh, counterterrorism operation uh, that we did lately. So that's kind of who I am. And, um, but not one also means we're going to hit 17 globe oddities. And I'll be honest, when I was researching them, it just, you learn so much and more and more that you didn't know. So what I hope is, I've got a saying, the faintest pencil is stronger than the mightiest memory. If one of these 17 really intrigues you, you're in the right place, okay? <laughs> Yvanka's pulled out some old maps representing a few of them. And, um, you know, just let your imagination go. But I'm going to bring them up a little bit of the not once, like, so what? Why are we talking about it and what might be important uh, for us in today's world? So, we'll go right on. The reason I love globes, it's to me where culture meets history, meets politics, geography, and art. And if you just walk around this AGS library, the whole story of where this collection came from New York City to UW-Milwaukee, are you kidding me? Uh, that's fascinating and, and best told by the staff here. But ask them, you know, how did we get this great collection? But that's why I love it. Those are great topics uh, near and dear to almost everyone's heart. So we'll, we'll hit it. Uh, the first oddity, can anyone tell, where is the North American quadrupoint? Quadrupoint meaning where four states or nations meet. Might be the easiest one, right? Yeah, it's got the Southwest. It is, right. So the acronym's CUNA, you know, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona. So I don't know if anyone's been there, but that's what it looks like. It's administered by the Navajo Nation, okay? So that's one of the more basic ones, but again, we're delving a little deeper. Who actually makes these survey markers? These, these unique, you know, these are all invented by um, the Berenson Company. And they're all over the world in a hundred different countries. So who makes them? Right here in Madison, the Berenson Company. And I actually lived on the east side of Madison and walked in, you know, a couple, about a decade. They're really friendly folks too, but you wouldn't know that the world headquarters for these monuments, the other ones there is Denali. I put it there because it's the uh, birthday of them being made a national park today. So again, an oddity there. Some great folks if you walk in, that's, um, uh, Peter and Philip founded it, and they are in 100 companies. So uh, stop by there sometime. But they mark a lot of these areas. But is there a second quadrupoint in North America? Okay, most mm -hmm. people don't know it. The answer is, yeah. yeah. Great job. And I love audience participation, because <laughs> I don't have to talk as much. But yeah, 1999, the Northwest Territories split up. They became a territory, and Nunavut came in. So there it is. Now, not quite as visited. Uh, that's what it looks like, and um, here's why it was described to get there. This is Ron Opatrill, a, a canoeist. He said it involves a 264-mile drive on gravel roads, then you got to fly 145 miles by float plane, then a one-mile canoe trip, half-mile hike through Muskeg, and a million mosquitoes. <laughs> and there you have it. So, but it is a quadra point, and um, pretty recent. I put my dad up there with his. Uh, his buddy Warren Asa. Uh, Warren unfortunately left us a year ago, but uh, my dad and Warren in 1948 canoed up in this area pretty darn close to the marker, okay? For how long? Six weeks. All summer. <laughs> All summer, and you were 19. So, so picture that, and I, I don't know how many UWM students there are here. Any that are, now there's a trip, so <laughs> they went up there. So that is the quadrant point, right? Uh, so is there an international quadrant point? Is, is there one out there in the world? There must be, right? <laughs> Why would he put it here? Okay. The answer is pretty much, okay, uh, between Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, they come real close together on the Zambezi River. It's the second smallest boundary in the world, 150 meters. So I'm just going just to say yes, it is a quadrant point. All right. So why did I bring it up? Um, that's what the ferry crossing looks like between Botswana and Zambia. And uh, a recent traveler said, it's about a 30 hour wait to cross it. Once you pay the ferry fee, the visa fee, the road tax, the carbon tax, insurance, and of course the local council fee, it's 300 bucks. Um, so now this is very interesting. As I was doing the research, 
The uh, Kazangula Bridge is set to open next month between uh, Botswana and Zambia. Now, what do you notice about the shape? Like yeah, <laughs> kind of goofy looking, isn't it? Well, Namibia never quite liked the ferry. They actually fired on it in the 70s because <laughs> they weren't getting any taxes or income. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Zimbabwe really doesn't like it because now they're totally missing out on any revenue. So they had to arc it around Zimbabwe territory. They did not want to <laughs> let them play. <laughs> Such is the world of international. So the not one, what's the so what? Why is there so much traffic here? Well, it's simple. About an hour away is uh, Victoria Falls. And has anyone been there? I have not Yes, sir. Any quick comment on it? Because it was fascinating, the photos. The odd thing is that you can get really, really close and not even know it's there. Wow. Um, wow. You come around the corner and there, there it is. Um, it's about a half a mile or maybe half a kilometer walk from the hotel down just a path and now uh, this is 25 years ago so I don't oh, they may have made it fancier but it's very weird how close you can get and not even notice it it's at this very closest spot if you yep. go down you know another two feet down mm -hmm. there that's where you're looking in got it I saw the cars but fascinating well again if you want to learn more thank you for for sharing that so quite an area there it, it's not Remote. It's very uh, a lot of traffic down there and pretty area. So, okay. Thank you. All right. So we just talked about the second shortest border. What's the shortest? Trust me, I did not know the answer to this when I started the project. But it's it's not even a football field, and there it is. Do I have any Spanish speakers in the audience? Hmm. Okay. So, Canon de Valles de la Gomera. It's even longer than almost the border, right? But <laughs> but that's it. It's 85 meters. But what's interesting about this is there's all these Spanish areas off the coast of Morocco, kind of a holdover from a day ago. This used to be an island, and then a uh, hurricane came in about 1934 and created this land bridge. So that is the world's shortest international border. And the question is, can you go there? Are there customs? You can't go there. All these island garrisons are garrisoned by an infantry platoon. Uh, in this case, this is the 54th Regiment. and. Um, they used to get out in Morocco, but unfortunately, in 2002, Morocco invaded one of these uninhabited islands. This is Parsley Island. Um, Spain retook it. So they took it with six people. Spain sent 12 and retook it. <laughs> Parsley Island. And I thought the only people happy were these gulls who lived there. They're endangered. Not a noise, gulls. But, so you can't go there, and I call this remains of the day. And um, I have a friend who, who lives in Morocco, Mafid. I went to business school with him. Mafid Kircherkow, he speaks French. And I said, why did, what's the deal with this stuff? And he said, you know, I think they were invaded as a litmus test to these other bigger enclaves, Sueta and Malia, just to see if Spain was serious about defending them. That's so, my question. Right? Yeah, why, why would you care about Parsley Island and, and it was invaded? But... So he thought, you know, it's a litmus test. But all we know is Colin Powell had to come out in 2002 and mediate. And for those of you who know, he had a lot bigger things on his mind in 2002. But uh, it almost escalated. So interesting. All that from the shortest border. All right, can anyone name the last piece of France in North America? Oh, Beautiful. Uh, yes. Hey. Have you been there? Yeah, I have actually. Nice. I was on a cruise on Polish Ocean Lines 30 years ago when we stopped there for a day. Where is it? It looks fascinating, and that's where it is. It's off the coast of Newfoundland, uh, Saint Pierre Miquelon. The, the quick history is they um, just got to go to that one. They're the last remains of New France, uh, discovered in 1520. The French lost them to the British in 1713, and somehow when the France lost the French Indian War, they lost everything, all their possessions except one thing. They got that back. And I, that's a topic unto itself. But so they've had it for a while. It was primarily for fishing. That's a great reason to have it. But uh, during Prohibition, um, guess what that became? <laughs> a smuggling area. French wine, liquor, right? We're so getting the happy still, hour. France still owns this little island. They do. It's, it's owned by France. And um, so Prohibition ended. Their economy crumbled. But they, they came back. And I'll actually 
turn it over to uh, my father, Colonel Ralph Olson, and my mom, somebody else who's been there, and um, we'll say a few words. Yes, um, I think there's uh, two people in the audience, uh, John and Mary Emery, who landed there in a light plane about 30 years ago. <laughs> Eugenie and I uh, visited about 20 years ago. One flies from Montreal, uh, Montreal to St. John's, Newfoundland, <clears throat> and then flies uh, westward on uh, uh, St. Pierre Airlines, a rickety old plane with about six seats. <laughs> this is a department of France, uh, just like Wa or Giron, and there's enough change of, uh, of civil servants there so that it is very, very French. Uh, Saint Pierre is where most of the people live. Uh, Miquelon is a uh, is a wildlife <coughs> reserve, and it's also the place where the Charley and Limousine cattle come for quarantine before mm -hmm. going to the United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. One very interesting thing about the islands: with the fall of France in 1940, uh, the Germans kind of eyed this as a place where their submarines mm -hmm. could stop, but Charles de Gaulle, in 1940, who founded the Free French, immediately dispatched one of the loyal naval ships, the world's largest submarine, the Surcouf, uh, with a company of marines and sailors to Saint-Pierre. And they occupied those islands and kept them French the entire war. Thank you. an interesting story if you want to hear it. it won't take long. Sure. The restaurants are French and they're wonderful. Um, I ordered some cheese for dessert, as we often do, right, in the French territory. And they said, no, no, madame, nous n'avons pas le fromage. We don't have cheese today. Mm. They're dependent on the boats coming <laughs> in from France. Oh, wow. They don't grow their own cheese and make it. So I said, well, we were walking in the days when we could do that around the island, and I said, I saw the boat with a French name. It must have been coming in from France. Il y a le fromage dedans. She would say, I know it. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, we oui, madame. So we were served a beautiful plate of cheese. <laughs> the travel tell. <laughs> Any other uh, comments about it? It's just a wonderful place. It, it, it like, is yeah. wonderful. It'd be fun to go back. Yeah. It's Al Capone. Piece of France, and it saves you on airfare too. <laughs> Al Capone hung out there during Prohibition. I had that as a note. So lots of reasons. All right, uh, northernmost contiguous United State is Minnesota. Minnesota. <laughs> yes, there it is. That little thing that sticks up there. Um, it's the only part of the contiguous USA north of the 49th parallel, right up here. And um, why is that? So that was a big, you know. So what? How did we get this place? Uh, it's all because of this gentleman here. John Mitchell, in 1755, drew this map. And my pointer's dying, but that's all right. And he kind of drew a lake of the woods as a big egg shape, which it isn't. He figured the Mississippi was somewhere west of there, which it isn't. So our man Benjamin Franklin in the Treaty of Paris used this map. In the actual treaty, he said, the boundary between U.S. territory and British possessions will run through the lake of the woods northwest point and due west to the river Mississippi. It's a geographic impossibility. But this thing stayed there for almost 40 years. So we bought the Louisiana Purchase. Still nobody knew where the northern border was. Lake Itasca wasn't even discovered yet by the Europeans. So finally, in 1824, David Thompson, a really accomplished British figure, was told to get up there and figure this out. So again, his marching orders was find the northwest corner of the lake. We found four of them. One, two, three, and one up there. So which one did he pick? Angle Inlet. So whether he's right or not, and that was the agreed upon border. So uh, it was adjusted slightly in uh, 1925 by an actual survey up here, but that's why that, and U.S. never wanted to give it up. They stuck to a treaty that was based on fantasy. <laughs> Two ways to get there. That's one way. I had to throw that in. There, there is an ice road there in the winter. I would not do that with a Boucher truck, Mary Margaret. <laughs> that guy needs a car. Maybe we'll help him out. But um, 
That's what it looks like. There's the border crossing. That's the actual border hut. It's a video <laughs> conference where they do, you know, make sure you're not bringing in anything. It's called uh, Jim's Corner. This looks like an outhouse, but that's it. Um, why do people go there? Why would a Minnesota drive 60 miles to go through here? Any guesses? Because. Because, dog, I like it. because it's there. Walleye fishing. Uh, it, it's hardly anyone's there. You got to be really committed, but once you're in there, um, there you go. Walleye fishing. Got to throw that in there, right? Okay. So um, this is a, this is a safest gated community. The U.S. Alcatraz. We're still on the 49th parallel. The Alcatraz. No. Point Roberts. Hmm. Washington, and I discovered this when I was deer hunting around here with a buddy, Dave Snyder. It's cut off from the rest of the United States by the 49th parallel. Uh, great for whale watching, but it not only exists, it's got about a thousand people. And uh, what it's known for is, A, if you want to ship a lot of online packages and you're Canadian, if it only ships to the U.S., that's where they have them shipped to. But it's also home to 50 witness protection people. <laughs> That's a very, it's the safest one because if you want to get in there, you got to go through customs. So I found that very fascinating. And if you know anybody from Point Roberts, <laughs> um, this is just a really quick 6B while we're on. Can you uh, go from California to Canada? Is it north? And the answer is believe it or not, if you drew a line from the north part of California, a part of Calif uh, Canada does lie south of Canada, or California. Uh, it's called Middle Island. It's mainly a bird sanctuary in Lake Erie. But the fact is, oh my goodness, you can't. There's actually um, 13 states that lie entirely north of Canada's south boundary. I just thought that was interesting while I was doing the research on these that this popped up. So let's go down to the island. Pelee Island. Great wine. Pelee Island. And Middle Island is south of it. So in the Army once, I was traveling near Fort Huachuca on Interstate 8. And can you go north, south, east, or west from a Mexican town and hit the U.S. border? Yes. Or why would it be here? Right. Has anyone been to Las Algodones? Okay, it's right on this point here. And Yovanka did put out a map of Arizona as it was surveyed. And if you look, you'll see two things. The border to California is not straight on a meridian. It's slanted. They learn from the northwest angle. So the surveyor <laughs> said, look, where does the Gila River intersect? And we definitely want to go south of San Diego one league, because we want San Diego. So that's why you get a funny shape border here. This shape border, the wives' table, says the Arizona surveyors were hanging out in Nogales and said the nearest bars in Yuma. <laughs> that's actually the tale they'll tell you down there, or they told us. But uh, that's actually part of the Gadsden purchase, and we paid $10 million for that for a railroad. But Mexico did want to have access to be able to get to the Baja. So the bottom line, there's the monument, northernmost part of Mexico. But if you go north, south, east, or west, you will hit the United States. Is the angle line the river or something? Uh, yeah, that's the, uh, the Colorado River coming up. There's the Gila. Great question, Doug. So um, as I researched it, a Lieutenant Whipple came up as a very heroic figure. You know, these surveyors out in that area, but he rescued a young Indian girl, gave her a mirror and some water. Two years later, Lieutenant Whipple was surrounded by 1,500 Apache warriors. The daughter of a chief showed the mirror, and they were spared. And that is a true story. But uh, I encourage you to look at that Arizona map that Yovanka found from when it was surveyed. Right. All right, so this one I actually discovered when I was in Fort Sill coming home in 1988. You know, Kaskaskia. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's a sharp crowd. I, so Kaskaskia, Illinois, not only was a famous revolutionary battle, uh, George Rogers, Rogers Rangers, right? But it was the first state capital of Illinois, 1819. So what happened? You know, the so what, deforestation, lack of taking care of the environment caused the Mississippi River to change course, and they left them literally surrounded by Missouri. Uh, you can't get there from Illinois, but it is part of Illinois. And I think the lesson there is that, you know, what happens under severe deforestation? River shifts, that's the actual bridge into Kaskaskia. Two floods, 
and population currently is nine. <laughs> it's the smallest town in Illinois. But think, to go from the state capital to population nine. So just kind of a warning about, you know, be, be good to your environment, right? So all the mighty falls. This one's kind of easy. Anyone know it? Delaware. I like this guy. Mm -hmm. you get up and yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Delaware is the only state with a round border. Like perfectly round. They measured it against uh, Newcastle. And so that's kind of interesting, but again, so what? Why is that kind of important here? Well, first of all, the reason it got that way is the Duke of York defeated the Dutch. They had New Holland, so uh, they were given, the British, they, that's why he said, you can get some extra territory. We're going to give you this circle. Okay, William Penn didn't really like that because he liked this Mason-Dixon line deal, but Delaware made out like a bandit twice. Pennsylvania still fought. They finally said, hey, where this circle comes down, it's here. I want this wedge. <laughs> 1898 topographic map, which is right here in the AGS, said, uh, we're going to give it to you, Pennsylvania. Delaware said, no, Delaware won. The treaty also said that Delaware will have the low tide border all the way up to New Jersey which doesn't happen anywhere else in the U.S. Usually most water courses are a median line down the middle of the water course, the Groshen method, or the main flow channel called the Falwag method. That's the lowest point. Delaware won this one too. New Jersey tried to build some refineries here, went to the Supreme Court, and Delaware won. So don't underestimate the Delaware uh, pens or whatever they are. So, that's about halfway through the lecture. This is a good time check to make sure I'm on time. I seem to be. Uh, any questions so far or comments? Charlie, does that border then change with the tide? No, it, it just it stays at the low tide mark. Great question. Okay. So it's marked. But New Jersey can't do anything along the shore because Delaware pretty much owns it right up to there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you learn a lot about law. And uh, uh, Ross Anderson, who's our neighbor, a lawyer here, I thought, boy, <laughs> Law is over my head. That's, that's some tough stuff. So th these are my two of my favorite comics. We're in a Globe Museum. I just like them, and I like Snoopy. So, yeah, that stupid beagle's gone to Petaluma. He couldn't find a way to a cap fight. Did you give him a map? He should at least have a map, says Lucy. Well, it wasn't exactly a map, said Charlie Brown. So there's Snoopy wandering around with a globe. I hope I'm going the right way. I should stay on the 40th parallel and west of the 120th meridian. They should mark meridians on the ground someplace. That's what Snoopy's saying. So, um, so I want to give these coffee mugs for Yovanka and, uh, and anyone that works here. So that's about the halfway point. I've spent a lot of time in uh, North America. So now I'm going to hit a few around the world. And uh, <laughs> you look at a map of Russia, Siberia, you'll see Kotelny Islands, Okovara Island, and then you suddenly see Jeanette, Henrietta, and Bennett. You're like, how the heck did these get up there? Um, so they are up north of Russia. It's a small inset there. But uh, the reason they exist and were discovered is Captain George DeLong. And there's a lot of maps from the DeLong expedition. This one was, they were brave and very ill-fated. Uh, he had a, a ship called the Jeanette, and he had 33 men on board. And they did, what they were trying to do was discover the open polar sea in the North Pole. I don't know the logic of that, but <laughs> it obviously didn't exist. But instead of going to discover the North Pole the standard way between Greenland, in Baffin Island, uh, he decided to go north of Russia. So they did, that is Jeanette Island, Bennett Island. Pretty obviously what happened, their ship was beset by ice. They set out in three rowboats, and uh, only the engineers, I'm just gonna make sure I got this right, yeah, um, Melville was the chief engineer. Only his lifeboat really had the survivors. DeLong's lifeboat, they made it to the Lena Delta, but they starved. You know, it's the middle of the Russian uh, winter, not a lot of game. But what I found interesting is, has anyone been to Annapolis? This is the largest monument in Annapolis. It's called the DeLong Monument, and it, it honors uh, George DeLong and his exploits. And I saw that, and I'm like, geez, I didn't realize this. So check out his uh, work. 
But uh, the book I have is called Hell on Ice, and it truly was. All right. So, what about those islands? Alaska State Senate supported a resolution to reclaim those islands. So we discovered them, right? But um, finally the Supreme Court ruled against it. So Russia kept the islands, but don't feel bad for Russia. That's the actual check where we paid $7 million for the state of Alaska, which is about $100 million in today's dollars. That's 13 miles of a Florida interstate right now. <laughs> Did the research on that. Yeah. So, so don't feel bad. They can keep Jeanette Island and Henrietta mm -hmm. Island. Okay. Um, who here was, you know, kind of a child of the 70s, 80s? Let's see, some of my classmates. And we, you know, we lived in the Cold War. You know, so these were the two that were most interesting to me. Uh, what is the only Cold War border between Russia proper and a NATO country? Finland. We're having a beer after. <laughs> Norway. At the tip of Norway, here's the Soviet Union and Norway, is a border. Now, I included the land of uh, Petsamo because Finland owned it in 1920, and one of my military heroes, uh, Marshal Mannerheim, literally defeated the Russians in a winter war outnumbered 10 to 1 using something called the Molotov cocktail. That's how they attacked the tanks. But unfortunately, Finland was caught between Stalinist Russia and Hitler Germany. And whatever you think, they had to kind of pick their poison. But um, in 1944, the Soviet Union did take over Petsamo during the Kirkinus Offensive. So I'm going to show why this is important later, but Finland lost out on their sea coast. So the current border is here. That's what it looks like, literally now in the middle of winter. And I had to put my cousin Greta in because, A, I'm Norwegian, she's Norwegian, that's her skiing, age 70. And, um, but the so what of this whole thing is Norway has a rule, you can't bring any migrants over via truck. Russia law says you can't foot traffic over the border. So what this has created, last year 5,000 migrants came over via what? <laughs> so that's what the border looks like. Okay, so I don't talk politics here, but you know, border walls are in the news and all that. But just think about that. There's ways, you know, they, they're using the legalities and loopholes. So uh, a lot of more Syrian immigrants, of course. Uh, the other so what out of this is it used to be each country owned about three miles of territory in the ocean. That's what a cannon would fire. Okay, then now it became 12 miles. Okay, but now there's something called the EEZ, which is the Economic Exclusion Zone, which goes out how far? 200, 200 nautical miles. Whoa. So why is this important? Oil was discovered up here. So Russia and Norway debated forever, and they came to their own agreement on, on where their EEZ would be. Uh, Stalin just wanted to run it right up into Svalbard, but that didn't work. But <laughs> I, I show this because Finland, think of what they lost out on. Okay, and this map is a, don't get blinded by it, but I love maps and globes. Somebody depicted the economic exclusion zones in the world. And think about this if you're a business person. There's Bermuda. <laughs> Bermuda gets its own 200 either way. Falkland Islands, okay? And of course, Norway way up there. So challenge the way you look at the world because obviously maritime and the resources are become more and more important as we go along. So. That 200 miles means a lot if you got a long coastline. Okay, so I threw in an 11B Cold War. Uh, I spent a year on the DMZ and um, a lot of tunnels. Did the Pan Moon Jam quick tour. But what I found interesting, why is it an oddity, is this border follows no geographic reason. Excuse me. At the end of fighting in 1953, each side just stepped back two kilometers. Didn't matter where, the, if the front line was there, you went back two kilometers. And I was never in the DMZ. I don't know if I'd be brave enough to go in there, but that is me back in Korea right there, the guy on the right. But it's become quite a natural habitat. Okay, red crowned cranes, mountain gorals, kingfishers. And I encourage you, if, if you really want to see some fascinating photos, uh, Park Jong Woo went in there in 2010 into the DMZ with a camera. North Koreans didn't really like that, but he he wasn't shot at. 
These photos are incredible. I mean, this bridge, no one's touched it since 1953. So um, I encourage you, if you go in there, <laughs> brave guy. And that is truly a global map oddity. All right. So, all right. <laughs> I'm in the automotive sales business, and everyone says, ah, a bunch of BS and all that. Well, a good lesson to us is Crockerland to always challenge what you hear. Has anyone been to Crockerland? <laughs> no, you can't. It doesn't exist. But maps that are out here, and if you look at Yovanka's area, showed that Crockerland was seen by Perry, the explorer, in 1906. Frederick Cook one-upped him. So who do you think Crocker was? He was the benefactor of Perry, and Perry was going to come to him in 1909 and ask for money so he could discover the North Pole. So he made, named an island quote, after his benefactor. Perry's diary says later he never saw a thing. <laughs> Complete fabrication. <laughs> Cook was also competing to go to the pole. He won up to him. Guess who his benefactor was? <laughs> Bradley. <laughs> so he named land after him. So always question your sources on these things. But these existed out there. And um, what's interesting is in 19... <laughs> 13, the Macmillan Party was founded by the AGS, American Geographic Society. So there's a lot of info on him. He was out to show that Crocker land existed. He supported Perry's claim to the poll. Cook said he didn't find it, so he was trying to disprove Cook. It was four years of some of the most miserable expeditions ever. There was a murder, a drunk captain who ran the ship on the ground. They were trapped for four years. <laughs> they were starving. They finally, the Inuit took pity on them and brought them out of hunt. Uh, Perry's mistress was on the uh, nearby, who had borne Perry two kids, and she caused a crewman to be murdered. She didn't do it, but they were jealous. So if you want to read about the Macmillan party or, or learn over it, example of what not to do. It was the last amateur Arctic exploration that, that I know of. It kind of ended the era. So and prove that Crocker Land did not exist. Okay. All right, we're coming through here. 26 miles is... Yeah, I think it was just in your mind, okay? Marathon. Okay, so this is a, a salute out to all of us that grew up in the 70s and 80s. Steve, Worth Park, you remember this? All right, so what does this have to do? Remember this junk? It was a spinning deal where if you got on as a kid and spun it, you probably broke an arm or something. <laughs> but I, I put it in there as an example of 26 miles is the equatorial bulge. So on all these globes at the equator it's 26 miles more diameter than at the poles, between the poles. Mm. So obviously if you're a kid you want to stand in the middle of this thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Out here you're spinning so fast. So um, what's interesting is right now we spin at about 750 miles an hour. At the equator it spins a thousand miles an hour. So that causes a bulge. So what does that mean? The tallest mountain in the world is not Everest. If you measure from the center, <laughs> it's Mount Chimborazo. In the middle of Ecuador, it happens to be right near the equator. But because of that bulge, if you want to be technical, it is the tallest mountain there. And um, I couldn't resist with the weather we're having putting this slide on. I've never been to Salton Principe, but it sits right on the equator. There's a nice monument and the beaches. I wish we could all go there. But I will say one nice thing happens at the equator. If you're trying to lose weight, you'll weigh two less pounds at the equator because of that bulge than you would normally near the pole. So, because of the gravity. Yeah, it's got to go through more. So there you go. So go out, have fun, have a margarita. So there's an oddity. That's right on the equator. It is. Anywhere. Yes. Yeah, the, the equator, I mean, it's a fascinating place. It's always 12 hours day, 12 hours night, in theory. So, <coughs> all right, so we're almost done here. Now, the world's oldest republic is a map oddity, and that's San Marino, which I was in and loved it, okay? That's called an enclave. An enclave is when the entire entity, in this case a country, is surrounded by another entity. So some people don't understand enclaves and exclaves, but this is an enclave. And um, what's interesting about San Marino is they're the first republic. Let me get my note here. 
Okay, there's only four smaller countries in San Marino, and Abraham Lincoln's actually an honorary citizen. They really appreciated that it was a republic. Um, so anyways, there was a World War II battle there between the Gurkha Rifles and Queens Cameron Highlanders, who finally uh, expelled the, uh, the fascist empire from there. But they, caught, they tried to stay neutral during World War II. They did have a haven for more than 100,000 uh, Italians and Jews who were seeking refuge. So we owe them a bit of, of debt there. So why did this place exist since the 4th century? So their Prime Minister, Gatti, says, We are a very small. We are on a mountain. It is not an easy place to conquer, but we have no strategic value. So I, I really like their reasoning why this country exists. And I encourage you, if you're in Italy, it's beautiful. And um, I'm about to turn it over to my sister, but there's a great beach of Rimini nearby, and, and uh, San Marino is great shopping, and great military medieval sword uh, shops. Okay, and I got a globe there, too. Yeah. All right. So we know what an enclave is. An exclave is where part of your country, not all of it, is surrounded by something else. So I'm fortunate to have my sister here, Wendy, who lived in Italy. Today? Please yeah. give Wendy a bit of hand. Oh, thank you. Lived in Italy 10 years. I'm not a colonel, but thank you for the cameo, mm -hmm. colonel, colonel. Um, thank you for letting me have this cameo. Um, I have lived in eight countries and visited 40 countries, so this one boggles my mind. But it's something Italian. I lived 17 years in Italy, and they don't tend to always follow the rules. So yes, the exclave here is a part of Italy that's actually surrounded by Switzerland. So um, I was married to a wonderful Italian at the time, and we lived in Milano. We would go to Como and visit a place called the Balcone d'Italia, which you can see here, you do not want vertigo because it literally drops straight down. <laughs> and um, he always would say, oh, Wendy, die. this is such a much faster way that we can get to Switzerland. Let's go the secondary borders. And really all he wanted to do was hairpin and horseshoe mm -hmm. turns at about 100 kilometers an hour. So what you would do, is there, the, is there yep. is that the next one? Oh, I don't have an next one. Oh, right. Okay, next one. that's fine. You can go back. Sorry. So if you go back, go back to here. the map here, yeah. so uh, Como is here, and you would go over a border into Chiasso, which is the main border. There are secondary borders that they use for escape routes, and those are the ones he wanted to take uh, mm -hmm. for us to get there and to Campione d'Italia. There's a huge casino there. It's a gambling place during World War II and World War I. The Italians would bring lots of their... Um, well, kid money, of course, because it was there. But also they learned lots of war secrets during World War II. Great. They would bring in lots of their spies and things like that and share, share secrets. But the one thing I did is I actually smuggled my parents into that area. <laughs> my parents were driving with us, and um, we learned only afterwards that no non-EU members can pass through that border. <laughs> it's only Italians to Switzerland. So I'm sorry, Mom and Dad, I smuggled you in. <laughs> 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 okay. But um, I don't know if you have that guard patrol photo, but it was I hilarious because every time we passed by, there would just be some guy up with his feet sleeping and just go, you know, <laughs> <laughs> go right in. So that's all I have. And I love it. And that's... Uh, There is. Yeah. You know, there's, there's quite a few of them. And, um, mm -hmm. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? But, Only yeah. from the standpoint of family history, I have a relative by marriage who, who grew up in Germany. And nice. she was in that exclave. Mm -hmm. and we're Jewish. She was trying to escape the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And oh. she said the Swiss were just such SOBs. Yeah. But <laughs> they, went, they, they could only afford forged documents. But in order to uh, have a better chance, they went during the night in the hopes that the light wouldn't let the, the Swiss border guard see that the documents oh. were forged. And she said just as they got to the border, the Swiss border guard lit a cigarette. And in the flare of the lighter, he didn't see that the documents were forged and her, her family was saved. <laughs> so she said, ever since then, she prays for the survival of the tobacco industry. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah. Your name again, sir? Is Ralph. Ralph, Ralph thank you. Uh, it's it's these uh, these exclaves are fascinating. And Wendy's right. During World War II, the uh, OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA, they maintained a unit there throughout the war. 
And apparently the Swiss just said they kept it low. As long as we kept a low profile, they would ignore it. So a lot of intrigue along that border for sure. So thank you, Wendy, for that. Excuse me, but yes. a few years ago there was an edited volume of somewhere over on the other side of this floor. Uh, a group of political scientists in different parts of Europe okay. got together and the, the book is about, according to political science, none of these countries can exist. This includes countries as large as Denmark. Wow. According to theory, they cannot survive. <laughs> they don't exist. Oh. <laughs> that would be an oddity that I can't <laughs> tackle. But, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of good maps out there that show things from so many perspectives, and it's, uh, it's interesting. But, no, I appreciate all the uh, feedback here, and uh, we'll bring it home with the last three. Where can you go from 1.30 to happy hour? You cross a time zone one step, and you're, you just cross three and a half time zones. Hmm. Ah. <laughs> hmm. So I study this because a friend of mine has been there, but you know, in the military, obviously, we study Afghanistan. Almost all of us have seen that finger that runs up there, the Wakhan Corridor. And, and I've always wondered, why is it there? Is it some great trade route? It really isn't. It is a somewhat of a trade route, but a very minor one. And you're wondering, how did that thing get up there? It's, uh, you see Big Pamir, Little Pamir. Uh, but first and foremost, yes, if you go from Afghanistan into China, it's a three and a half hour difference. China, I think, is the same time zone for the whole country. So, easy way to go back in time. But um, what this stems from is, is the Great Game. Some of you may be familiar with Kipling's. But the Great Game was fought between Britain and Russia in the stands in Afghanistan for years. And I kind of wanted to bring this oddity to life from a uh, pretty brave uh, British captain, Francis Young Husband. Now there's a name for you, right? Uh, but he, said, he was up there in that walk-on quarter. And he said, as I looked out the door to my tent, I saw 20 Cossacks with six officers riding by with a Russian flag up front. And you got to understand, you're in this area, so to see anyone uh, European would be uh, noteworthy. Um, I sent a card and invitation to the officers mm -hmm. to come in for refreshments. Some came in. The chief officer was Colonel Yanov. I gave the Russian officers some tea and Russian wine. I told Colonel Yanov, reports had reached me that he was proclaiming that the Pamirs were Russian territory. I asked him if this was the case. <laughs> so again, you know, if you go back and read these books, it really comes to life. But obviously, he, he caught Colonel Yanov on his game. And um, what happened is the walk-on quarter was drawn by the British and Russians for one simple reason. A buffer zone so they wouldn't touch anywhere. That's why that exists. It's not so much that there's a huge road through there. And um, I put myself, there's a picture of me in Bosnia in 1995, because we created a zone of separation. And I will say one thing, it's regarded as one of the most successful NATO operations. You know, whatever <laughs> you think, but you just separate them. So that's what the British did. We kind of took a cue from that in Bosnia. And my friend Joe D'Addario, who I served with in Korea, Bosnia, he went up there two months ago. There's Joe. And here's what he wrote. He said, um, it's, uh, the Pamir Nod is called the roof of the world. He said it's got some badass mountain ranges. Okay, I think four of them converge. But Joe's description, ruggedly beautiful, completely unforgiving. Small and extremely remote border with China. He said, I went to that. I don't think he did the time zone change, though. Uh, my son and I got to Little Pamir and headed north along the Tajik-China no man's land border and the stunning Tian Shan Mountains. There's no shortage of great game oddities in Central Asia, and Wakhan is right there at the top. These extraordinary hardy people occupy an area that has an absolute, utter remoteness to it. There is absolutely nothing up there. No roads, electricity, or sanitation. I can't stress how tough these people have it. But there it is. There's Joe by the sign. So that's the roof of the world and an interesting why of the Afghan map. All right. So we're getting toward the end here. The smallest island split by an international border. St. Oh. Mark. Yeah. Just to show a hand, who's been here? Yeah. I mean, where can you be in a half Dutch, half French at the same time? What about Hispaniola? Uh, yeah, Hispaniola is, so this would be the smallest one. 
Oh, yes, but you're right. Hispaniola is, is definitely, I'll actually, there's about to be a smaller one. I'll, I'll mention that. But <laughs> anyways, um, there's the monument to 1648 where they, actually what happened here is the Spain owned it. And they built a huge fort and they kicked the Dutch out. And they owned it for years and then they realized there's nothing here. <laughs> there's no gold. They were kind of more worried. Up, so they abandoned it. The Dutch and French came in at the same time and in 1848 said, you know what, why fight? Why? So they created this border. French actually got a little bit more up here, by the way, square footage. Napoleon took care of that. But, uh, interesting place. If you're on Captain Oliver's in Oyster Bay, the hotel is on the Dutch side, the restaurant's French side. <laughs> Pretty cool. You can walk in and hang out at a border. Uh, plane spotting's big. And Dane and Charlotte, I put you in the presentation. There you are. Okay. Age one and three. I was just demobilized from the army. Uh, 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 so fun, fun place. I, I really recommend it. The smallest island is about to be separated. If anyone's heard of Hans Island, I'd be amazed. Hans Island sits between Greenland and the northern part of Canada in the channel. The Dutch, excuse me, the Canadians and Danes have fought nothing, but every year they debate this island. <laughs> So what happens, this is a true story, the Canadians will go there, plant their flag, and leave Canadian whiskey. The next year, the Danes will come from Greenland, put their flag up, and put on some Dutch schnapps. It's been going on every year since 2002. So if you look up Hans Island, okay, so if you want a free drink, go up to Hans Island and grab the bottles. But that, they're talking about splitting it after all these years, so that's why I bring it up. A lot of weird research doing this. So, all right, I'm going to bring it home. I think I'm on time. You guys have been great. This brings it home to us. Okay, so what's the Lost Peninsula? I'm getting to that. It's the UP, but nationally, the Lost Peninsula is known as a part of Michigan and Ohio that's cut off by the Michigan-Ohio border. It's basically a marina. About 140 people live there, but you can't get to this part of Michigan via the mainland. All right, so how did that come into being? The Toledo Strip was a dispute between Michigan and Ohio. So what happened is the Northwest Territories were set up. They said, well, they're gonna be five states, okay? The southern boundary will be the southernmost part of Lake Michigan on over. Okay, so who really worried about that? Ohio, they said the more <laughs> south Lake Michigan is we could even lose our Lake Erie coastline. So they commissioned a team in two, uh, 1802 to come up with this little slanted deal. Okay, it's not straight. Okay, Michigan said, I want the initial uh, deal, South Lake Michigan all the way out here. So that became the dispute. There was actually a war, but not really, in 1830. It's the Toledo War. Okay, I think one sheriff was stabbed in a bar fight. And I feel bad for the sheriff, but... Uh, but what happened is Ohio was a state Michigan wasn't yet. So what happened? They held the Frostbite Convention in Minnesota, Michigan. I thought this was applicable here. Not Minnesota, Michigan, excuse me. And President Andrew Jackson said, look, if you want to be a state and get your statehood, you're going to prove this treaty. You, you're going to give up the Toledo Strip. Michigan, finally, they were kind of cash-strapped, and they said, well, what do we get out of it? So what do they get out of it? There you go. So if you wonder, like I do, how Wisconsin lost the Upper Peninsula? Well, unfortunately, we weren't a state, and we didn't have a lot of people here. So Michigan lost. They were actually weren't happy. But what did they lose out on? Logging, mining, some great views. But this story is a happy ending. For them. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, right on. Okay, since 1959, the curse of the Lost Peninsula. Packers, 31 playoff wins, seven championships. Can you believe it? The Lions, since 1959, Lombardi, one playoff win. So I think we got them. So, so um, you guys were a great crowd. I hope you enjoyed the uh, 17 map oddities. I do want to thank my company for letting me off work a little bit, Bushi Automotive Group. Um, you know, I'm their sales director, which means I'm in 18 stores, not running them all, but it, it's a lot. But I joined when I left the Army because of their community involvement. So uh, we've got some pens on the back table and everything, and um, we are a top workplace for the last 
top five workplace last seven years in a row. So if anyone knows somebody that wants to join us, just please have them see me. There's my uh, email address. All right. And uh, I'll just close it out by saying I like to salute the surveyors. All these maps it took some brave folks going out there. Um, there's the Alaska. I mean, that border I couldn't even cover. There's just so much on the Alaskan Panhandle. But there they are at the Arctic Circle, Canadian and um, U.S. surveyors. And um, before I give my quote, does anyone have any questions? I'd like to open it up. It's a lecture uh, or comments. Wow. Ready for happy hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> the lock on or Hans Island? Yeah. Um, well, great group. And, you know, I'll, I'll hang around and have refreshments. Um, I just, uh, you know, I'll leave you with two things. One is a quote by Thomas Riggs, a boundary chief. The vast solitudes, uninhabited and lonely, have an irresistible call. The surveyor dreads the day when he shall have thrown his last diamond hitch, broken his last camp, and from the deck of a homeward bound streamer have watched a free life fade away in the mist with distant hills. So these are truly the, the adventures that created a lot of these maps that we look at today, you know, before airplanes or, or satellites or anything. And um, so I'm just going to quickly, and what I want to leave everyone is, is, is thank you for doing this. I haven't given a lecture in 20 years, and it's been fun. And I just, I've got a motto that there's a song that came out in 83 when I graduated high school called In a Big Country. Dream stay with you. I'll play it. Go back to my presentation. I had to put it in big country, but um, so the lyrics are in a big country. Dream stay with you, like a lover's voice fires the mountainside. Stay alive. There's my dad on his canoe trip, and um, I once asked my boss what he would have done different. My boss was four, not, not Frank Boucher, but. He said, I would have packed the car more. And I think for all of you being here, you got a love of travel and the world, so thank you. And there's just my kids, and uh, kids, we're going to continue to go to fun places. Because that's what uh, gets you out of your comfort zone, right? Hope to stay with you guys. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting.